وصلوات الله والسلام على نبينا المصطفى وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد We'd like to inshallah take this opportunity to draw your attention to a really critical part of the month of Ramadan as well as a very significant part of the Muslim identity and personality. And that is the danger of abandoning the Quran. There's a phenomenon that you will find it is inside of our Ummah right now where all of the khayr that is connected to the Quran you'll find many people unfortunately not tapping into the book of Allah the way the Quran has commanded and the way that the Prophet وسلم, has instructed especially as it relates to Ramadan Abdullah ibn Abbas may Allah be pleased with him and his father he was one of the younger companions that the Prophet developed Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he paid a lot of attention to to the point where he was the most prolific companion in regards to the tafsir of the Qur'an, Abdullah ibn Abbas. Many people think that ibn Abbas was some old man because he's mentioned in so many hadith and because of his personality and the religion when in reality when the Prophet died Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abdullah ibn Abbas was only about 16 years old. 15, 16 years old. He was very, very young. But the Prophet grabbed him one time and he made dua for him. And that dua was Allahumma faqihu fiddeen. Another hadith, alimhu ta'weeb. Oh Allah, give him understanding of the interpretation of the Quran. So during the time of Abu Bakr and Umar, and those great companions, when they were the Khalifa, they used to bring the elders to the Shura. They would have to decide big issues concerning the community. And Umar would have Abdullah ibn Abbas in that room with those big companions who participated in Badr, Uhud, Mustalaq, Tabuk, all of those wars. Hunayn, so there were some elders from the companions who looked and said, why is he here? We have sons just like him, his age. Why is he here? Rama said to them, do you know the meaning of this surah? You know the tafsir of that? The people started giving the interpretations. He said, what about you, Abdullah ibn Abbas? What's your interpretation? He said, Allah revealed this surah on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi to let him know he was going to die. It wasn't that what the other people said was wrong, but that was the main meaning of that surah. It was a tanbi, an indication. Ya Muhammad, you're going to die soon. Abdullah ibn Abbas knew that because he had been gifted and blessed by Allah with insight into the Quran. So the point here is, he was a tremendous companion. And what made him tremendous was his position with the Quran. Now we come from places like Nepal, where people are very cultural, very traditional. And the youngsters sometimes don't have anything to say. Sometimes to the point where the boy is going to marry a girl that the mother and the father decide who they're going to marry. 2018, we're still doing that. There's nothing wrong with an arranged marriage. As long as the girl is okay with that and the boy is okay with it. But the culture, the culture. We come from a culture where the youngster doesn't have anything to say. Abdullah was young. Abdullah ibn Abbas, he was young. And they had that culture where the youngsters respected the elders. But the Quran raised him up and put him on par and above other people who were older than him. The Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, about that Quran, in the Hadam Kitab, in the Allah, the Yadru Bihadam Kitab, Akwamim, the Yadru Bi Akhari. Allah will raise up certain people with this book and put other people down because of this Quran. That's a story unto itself, but the point is, Ibn Abbas, he said, 
describing the Ramadan of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, Bukhari Muslim. كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أجود الناس وكان أجود ما يكون في رمضان إن يلقاه جبريل وكان جبريل يلقاه في كل ليلة من رمضان في يدارسه القرآن ورسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أجود من الريح المرسلة He said that the Prophet was the most generous person صلى الله عليه وسلم If you asked him for something he never said no even if he didn't have it, he would borrow it from someone. They said as it related to his vocabulary, the only time he said no is when he would say things like, La ilaha illallah. When he would say to someone, La tagdab, don't become angry. Mind your own business and don't mind other people's business. You know those ahadith that tell you, don't do this, don't do that. But if you went to him and said, can I have this, can I have that? He would never say no. Ibn Abbas said he became even more generous in the month of Ramadan. So the first point is, if a person is fasting and he's not spending more of his time, his money, his effort, making jihad in the daytime. This is jihad, not eating 18 hours a day. It's jihad, not eating, not drinking. But he has to continue the jihad in the nighttime. Ramadan is just not in the morning daytime. Ramadan is also in the nighttime. And he's going to make jihad. He's going to be tired. And he's going to pray that taraweeh. And he's going to make effort. He says, so he used to be more generous in the month of Ramadan. And he used to be more generous in the month of Ramadan when Jibril would come to him and go over the Quran with him. Every night in the month of Ramadan. So if a person is not reading the Quran more in the month of Ramadan, something is wrong with your fast. I'm not saying your fast is not accepted. I'm not saying that. But you're not doing the fast of the sunnah. The fast of the sunnah is, you're going to spend more. So today, someone's going to come and say, give to this project. Tomorrow, someone's going to come and say, give to that project. Four days from now, someone give to this. Every day, it's like that. The one who understands the beauty and the nature of Ramadan is not going to say, man, we ain't going to stop asking us for money. That's the nature of Ramadan, that you have to spend more. And you have to read the Quran more. So... In the year that the Prophet died, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Jibril came to him two times and went over the Quran with him every night, twice. Allah mentioned in the Quran in Surah Qaf, La tuharrik bihi lisana kabi ta'jana bihi. Inna alayna jam'ahu wa Qur'ana. Fidha qara'nahu fattabi' Qur'ana. Jibril would come to the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the Prophet would read, and he would read it very fast. Allah said, don't read the Qur'an fast like that, Ya Muhammad. We're going to bring it together and cause you to memorize it. And when we do that, then you follow its recitation. So Jibril would tell him in every night of Ramadan, put this surah here, put this ayat there, put this here, put that there, put that there. So the Qur'an was being revealed over a period of time. So in the last year, the last Ramadan, Jibril came two times every night and went over the Qur'an twice, twice. Fatima said, why did Jibril come to you this year? And he went over the Quran twice. Rasulullah said, because I'm going to die soon. I'm going to die soon. Allah mentioned in the Quran, inna nahnu nizzalna dhikr wa inna lahu lahafidun. I revealed this Quran, the dhikr, and verily I'm going to protect this book. One of the ways it was protected is Jibril came to him and told him, put this there, put that there, this ayat there, this surah there, and so forth and so on. So that when he finally died, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Qur'an was protected. So the point of all of that kalam is, if a person is not reading that book more in the Qur'an in the month of Ramadan, something's wrong with your fast. Now I want to bring another issue to your attention before I go into my subject, and that is, Allah Ta'ala answers the dua of the believers, as he mentioned in the Qur'an in many hadith. وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِهِ أَنِّي Ya Muhammad, if my slaves ask you about me, I'm close to them. They don't need a middleman. They don't have to ask you to make dua to me. They don't have to ask someone in the grave to make dua to me. I'm close to each one of them. We're closer to each one of them, closer than his juggler vein. Allah is right there with you. You don't have to ask anybody. The Malvisab, you don't have to ask anybody. 
And Allah said, if they call on me, I'll answer their call. Many ayat question in the month of Ramadan. And the dua of the traveler is accepted. The dua of the fast is accepted. We make dua all over the Muslim world, all in the UK. Allahumma hdina fi min hadith. Everybody says, Ameen. He's saying the Iman in his dua of kunud. Allahumma izz al Islam wal Muslimin. Help Islam the Muslims. Ameen, Ameen, Ameen. But Palestine is still dealing with what it's dealing with. Al Iraq, Kashmir, Syria. The Muslim world is still, you put your finger on the Muslim world, the map, you pick it up, it's dripping blood. And we're making dua and we're fasting all Why? We have to ask ourselves that. Part of it is because the Ramadan that we fast is the cultural Ramadan. It's the one that is, I, I'm just eating, I'm not eating, that's it. But what about all of that other stuff? The real spirit of Ramadan. I don't want to put anyone down. I don't want to come with a dark cloud here. Uh, because we're all acting better in the month of Ramadan. We're all acting better, no doubt about that. But the person who's fasting in the Ramadan and he's playing PlayStation and he thinks that's fasting, wasting time, something's wrong with that Ramadan. The person who's fasting in the month of Ramadan and he's watching those movies and listening to music, he may still have a girlfriend and all of that, there's something wrong with that Ramadan. Although we're better people, Although we, we behave better because that's the nature of fasting. But the fast of the Prophet وسلم, included more than just eating, not eating, and not drinking. That's the easy part. I don't know about you. I don't know about you. But for myself, we're fasting 18 hours. It's not hard to fast. The only time I have a problem is number one. Number one, after I break my fast, after I break my fast, I got to go and break Isha and Taraweh. Once I eat, my body starts saying, oh man, I don't want to go nowhere, I'm tired. That's a challenge that I have. And after I go home and I go to sleep for one hour, hour and a half, and I wake up, I'm feeling tired. But after that, once the day is going, fasting is easy. For all of us, it's easy. But that's not the fast. The real jihad of Ramadan is being consistent with trying to leave off sins. Fasting with your eyes and your ears, and especially your tongue. And many of us, our problem comes when we meet people. As long as you're away from people, you're not making hiba. You're not making the mima. You're not lying. You're not swearing. You're not doing crazy things. But as soon as you start meeting people, that's when your fast starts to get compromised. So the point here is, what is the fast? He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Fasting is not that you leave off your food and your drink. That's not the fast. Fasting is leaving off a level or rough. A level is things that bring you no benefit, like PlayStation. Some of the old, older people here are like me. I have children. I have a son. I have a son who, if I don't tell him to get off a of PlayStation, he won't. So lot will come and go, and he'll still be on that PlayStation. And it doesn't develop any skill set except how to get better at PlayStation. Not going to help him. So I'm saying if you have a kid, or if you're a kid here, girl, boy, and you're a person, especially these little guys right here, my little man's in them right here. If you're a person who can get up at the time of Salat, make wudu on your own, and go and pray, then you should make such a shukr to Allah for giving you a kid like that. Because that's not the norm in our community with these millennials. That's not the norm. So, the Quran in the month of Ramadan. Two things I want to share with you about this issue. Listen. Yom al Qiyamah, people are going to come and they're going to have conflicts with other people. They have conflicts with their mothers, their fathers, their ex wives, their father in laws, sister in law. And this is another crazy thing about Ramadan is shaitan. And that is. We're fasting and we're feeling good and we're feeling better and we're doing some efforts. But we've forgotten some of the many issues we have created with other people where we need to say we're sorry. And we need to ask people to forgive us and stuff like that. A person is fasting, but he has a lot of unresolved issues that maybe his fast is going to be given to that person. Surah Al-Kath has that ayat, and many ayats that say this thing, 
الذين ضل سعيهم في الحياة الدنيا وهم يحسبون أنهم يحسنون السنعة أولئك الذين كفروا بلقاء ربهم فحبتت أعمالهم فلا نقيم لهم يوم القيامة وزنا Say unto them, Muhammad, should I show you people that you know who is the worst person in terms of his deeds? The one who's doing actions and deeds and he's going to come Yom al Qiyam and his deeds are going to be nothing. But he's thinking he's doing good. That's because they disbelieved in Yom al Qiyam. So we won't give him any wazin. So a person is doing a lot of deeds, a lot of deeds, a lot, only for those deeds to be given to someone else. I work for the masjid. I get direct deposit. My money goes straight into my account from the Muslims. If my check was short, I saw, man, they didn't give me all my money. I'm going to go to the office of my best chair, and I'm going to turn the table over and say, where's my money? You guys took my money because I work hard for mine, and you're stealing money from my kids, taking money from my mouths. You're going to give me my money. And I think most of you are going to be like that as well. What about the one who was fasting 18 hours and that fast is just going to his ex-wife? That fast is going to people who he oppressed, borrow money from him, didn't give the money back, so forth and so on. So the fasting, the fasting, the fasting of the sunnah, it is not just not eating and drinking. That's the easy part. It's making that jihad of trying to really be a better person and trying to settle the scores and just trying to do more in this month, perhaps perchance after Ramadan you still be doing the right thing. So, Yom Al-Qiyamah, we're going to have conflicts with people. Conflicts. The worst conflict you want to have is to have a conflict with Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There's a hadith that says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Inna ashad al-nas adabin Yom Al-Qiyamah the one who get the worst punishment, Yom al Qiyamah, will be a man who killed a prophet or that prophet killed him. He's going to get the worst punishment. Why? Because he killed a prophet. Like Bani Israel. They used to kill prophets left, right, and center. Or a prophet killed him because he was trying to kill the prophet. So you don't want to be in opposition to the NBA. They're the worst people. Some people will be in opposition to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I will be the opponent against three people, Yom Al-Qiyamah. The first person he met, mentioned, Rajulun A'ta Biya Thumma Ghadra. A man who made an oath using my name. And then he was, um, he proved to be, um, Treacherous. Someone who's coming and he's saying for example, I ask you guys by Allah, give to this project. We're going to build a masjid. We're going to do that. And he's using Allah and his messenger, the deen. And he's lying and he's stealing the money. That's one. The second one in this hadith, he said, Rajulun ba'ahurun thumma akala thamanun. A man who took a free man, he was free, put him in slavery, and then sold him. Because that's what Quraysh used to do, the Arabs. He would say, yo, come and visit me. Come to my tent today. We're going to have lunch. I'm going to slaughter a camel for you. Bring your brother and your uncle. Come, come. When he comes, me and my sons and all of us, we put him in slavery. Tie him up. And then we go and sit and sell him. He said, the third place, the third person, and there's someone we have to pay attention to. He said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, rajulun istajra ajirin fastofa minhu. The third man is a man who hired another man. He hired him. Come work in my store, do my car, whatever. He hired him. And then when he got his labor from him, he didn't pay him his money. And he's fasting in the month of Ramadan. And he ripped people off. The point here is, keep the focus. You don't want to come as an opponent to the Prophet Yom al -Qiyam. Maybe none of you are one of those three that I just mentioned. But some of us will fall into this one I'm talking about today. Those who abandoned the Quran. Look what Allah said in the Quran about our Ummah. وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ رَبِّ إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُورًا Prophet Muhammad is going to come and he's going to say, Oh my Lord, 
My people, my community, they have abandoned the Quran. They left it. They abandoned it. The only time they read it is if something happens, they'll read it. If something happens, they read Yasin over the dead person, for an example. If they want to choose a name for their child, they get the Quran and open it up and put their finger right there and they look at the word and then they call their son Sama or Shams or Kamar. I even know a brother who did that, he called his son Dum, which means blood. That's the only time you get the Quran. But the Quran being a part of his life, learning it, and so forth and so on, that's not what he's doing. So abandoning the Quran, that's what we want to talk about today. As an encouragement, not to be of those people, to look at yourself. In the past, Ikhwan, in the past, I see these little guys here, my nephews, my little man in them right there. That's my main man, 50 grand. What's your name, son? You, you, what's your name? Huh? Seifu Haq. What? Seifu Haq. Haq. It's a big name, Seifu Haq. My man Seifu Haq, in the past, in the past, I meet Seifu Haq for the first time. I say, Seifu Haq, how much Quran do you know? He says, I memorized three Jews, seven, eight, nine, ten Jews. Based on that answer, it would give the person of the past an indication of how the mother and the father are with the tabi of the kid. Our community, I was in a masjid the other day. The kids were throwing water bottles out of the third floor of the masjid at the passing cars while the people were downstairs praying tarawih. They were throwing water bottles outside, hitting the cars from the masjid. The best place in the city is the masjid. Allah loves the masjid more than any other place in the earth. This place right here. Allah loves this place right here more than the most expensive property or the nicest looking property in this city. And the Muslims were engaged in the best issue, a salah, taraweeh. But our Shabbat, these millennials, they were upstairs throwing water bottles at cars passing by. Maybe they're going to kill someone. So now, you want to get an idea? Where's the tarbiyah? Where's the concern? of the father as it relates to his child got to look at how much that kid knows that Quran so abandoning the Quran what is it and what does it mean it means a lot we'll deal with about four things three or four things what time is it right now anybody got the time seven o'clock we'll go up to about 7 30 inshallah abandoning the Quran see where you fall in this category because it means a lot <coughs> Abandoning the Qur'an ikhwani, means not making a tadawi with the Qur'an. I'm sure you guys know being mere purgis, speak Urdu, a dawa. What does the word dawa mean? A cure, medicine, a tadawi with the Qur'an. Seeking cures for your sicknesses with the Qur'an. Making rupia. We don't do it. Most people don't do it. And those who do it, they do it in the khurafa way, khurafat, bid'ah, shirk way. We think we have to bring some special reader of the Qur'an to do ruqya on us, then you can do the ruqya on yourself. And you don't even need anybody else who's going to charge you 100, 200, 300 pounds. Not only that, he may not even be sincere. He's just doing it for the money. Whereas you are going to do ruqya on your son, on your wife, on yourself with ikhlas because you want to get well. He just wants your money. He just wants your dough. That's all he wants. But we're very quick to look at someone else. Mm -mm. People of a Tawheed. That's the benefit of a Tawheed. Connect yourself to Allah. Connect yourself to Allah, first and foremost. When I'm living at in Liverpool, we have some famous footballers. Two of them. Mo Salah and this other young brother from Senegal. Senegalese brother makes 80,000 pounds a week, more than that, 80,000 pounds. And he's real humble. Can't come to our masjid to pray, you know why? Because if he comes to the masjid to pray, everybody's gonna take a cell phone out and say, take a selfie, take a selfie, they're gonna bother him. They won't leave him. Amir Khan, the boxer, was gonna fight in Liverpool a few weeks ago. Came to our masjid, same thing. And why do people behave like that when they see so-called celebrities 
And the celebrity may be a criminal, doesn't pray, no hijab, a criminal. But the way we are, could be an actor, actress, singer, and we go overboard. And you may be a person better than that person with Allah. Why are we like that? A lot of times it's because we don't know Allah. If we knew Allah, we know, we'll know, we'll know. The real hero in Al Islam are the prophets and the messengers, the companions. And that guy right there is a slave, Abdullah, like everybody else. Fakir, miskin. So you just leave him. The man would come from the desert. He would come from the desert, come to the Prophet's Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he would have to go and say, hey, where is Muhammad? That man would say, He's, uh, you see that man over there laying in the dirt? Because the Rasul just blended in with everybody. He just blended in. But now, the celebrity, we're going to make sure that he, everybody knows who he is. Everybody. Now, at Tawheed, you know Allah, you know yourself. You know Allah, you know other people. You want to do a business? If you know Allah, no one's going to tell you, you can't do it. Because you know Allah is, He'll do what he wants to do. So someone says, no one from your family ever went to the university. You can't do it. No, this business that you're trying to open up is this, the whole city is saturated and you can't do it. Allah is ar razaq dhul quwwat al -mateen. But when you don't know Allah, when you don't know Allah, you do all that crazy stuff that Quraysh is doing. <coughs> crazy stuff. So as it relates to At-Tadawi, look what Allah said about his book. He said about his book, <laughs> We revealed the book, and in it is a shifa and a rahma for the believers. It's a shifa. Not just one ayah said that, another ayah. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, qad ja'atkum maw'idatum min rabbikum wa shifa'un lima fi sudur wa hudan wa rahmatun lil mu'mineen. Oh, you believe there has come to you a book. In it is a mo'idha, a powerful preacher. And in it is a shifa for the diseases that are in the heart. And in it is guidance and a rahmah for the believers. So right now, most of you, I don't know your names. I know my brother, Javid. I know my main man, 50 Grand, Sayfullah. I know my man. I know Dita Ali from way back in the day from the old school. Dita Ali, old school, holding holding me a port down. I know the Ali. Most of you I don't know. But many of you have problems with your health. That one has eczema. That one has uh, arthritis. That one has high blood pressure. That one gets migraines. This one has that. He has that. Everybody. Our wives, our daughters, every month they get pains and stuff like that. All kind of, everybody got issues. But before doing the Qur'an, doing Shifa and Ruqya, we'll look for the ivory pro friend and this and that, which is okay, which is okay. But if the person really believed in the Qur'an, like those companions, look what happened. Aisha came to the Prophet وسلم, and complained about one of the relatives from Ahl Bayt being sick. The Prophet told her, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ali Jiha Bil Qur'an, read the Qur'an over them. Every night before the Prophet went to sleep, he would read Ayatul Kursi. He would read Amin al Rasul bima unzila, bima un, Amin al Amin al Rasul bima unzila alayhim in Rabbi wal Mu'minun. He would read that. Qulu Allahu Ahad three times, Al Fala three times, and Nas three times. After that, he would blow on himself and do Rukya every night on himself. Every night before going to sleep. Everybody knows those stories. Everybody. Not only that, Sayyid Bukhari, some companions were traveling, they were 30 people, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, another young companion, who the Prophet paid attention to. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri was traveling. They came to a group of people and they said, hey, we're traveling, can you just give us some hospitality? They was like, nah, they was very hostile towards the Muslims, you got to keep rolling. Just keep rolling, don't stop here, move out, bounce, get out of here. The Muslims didn't stand there and beg. Give us welfare, give us welfare, help us out. They just left. Allah decreed that a scorpion or a, a snake, poisonous snake, bit their leader and he was dying. They said, go and catch them and tell them to come back, see if they have anything that can help our leader. He's okay, he's okay. He's all right, he's all right. He's all right. 
Because if he keeps moving, I'm going to jump on him, all right? I'm going to personally jump on you, man. I'm going to jump on you. Your thobe is going to turn red color, all right? I wouldn't do that to you, little man. So look what happened. The leader was dying. They went to Abu Sayyid al and said, hey, can you come and help out with leader with something? He got stung by a scorpion. He's dying. Bit by a snake. Rattlesnake. He's dying. He said, yeah, we'll come and we'll help him, but if we help him, we want you to give us 30 sheep. 30 sheep for each man in our, 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 our caravan. They said, okay, anything, anything, let's go. They went. I will say the Khudri read Surat al-Fatiha seven times on the man. And after reading it seven times, he spit on him. Because the barakah of the Quran and the spit got him. After that, the man jumped up and started walking around as if he was let out of chains. We go visit our relative in the hospital. We're shy and embarrassed to even read the Quran on Why? It was the non-Muslims of the good. What are you talking about? Read the Quran on the man. Read the Quran on him. You don't have to be in the hospital. So abandoning the Quran, part of it means we never, ever, ever make rupiah with the Quran. Before I move on, I have to stress this point. When you don't have aqidah, you have this crazy idea about the special sheikh is going to come and read. Man, I'm telling you guys, get away from relying on that special sheikh. Because a lot of times that dude ain't doing nothing but stealing your money. That's all he's doing. You read the Quran yourself. You do it yourself. And do it for any and every sickness you have. A headache, toothache, whatever it is. Second meaning of abandoning the Quran is that we don't judge by the Quran between ourselves. When we get beef and drama and static that happens between us, we don't judge based on the Quran. We judge based upon, well, that's my daughter, so I'm on her side. Well, that's my cousin, so I'm on his side against them. Well, that guy is in my religion, so I'm on his guy against them. He's from my village, I'm on his side. That's not our religion. Well, he's from the elders, so I'm on his side. That's not our religion. We have to judge based upon the book of Allah. We're not Jews or Christians, Sikhs, Hindus. We have a book, and that book was revealed to be a judgment between the people. And that's why you have all of those ayats. فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ فِيمَا شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُوا فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَرَجٍ مِّمَّا قَدِهِ وَيُسَلِّمُ تَسْلِيمَ Allah swore by himself. He said, I swear by your Lord. They do not believe. If they do not cause you to judge in their case, Ya Muhammad. And then whatever you judge, they can't have any problem with it. They totally submit. Allah said in the Quran, فَإِن تَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فَرُدُّوا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ ذَلِكَ خَيْرٌ وَأَحْسَنُ تَعْوِيلًا If you have ikhtilaf about anything, they return it back to Allah and His Messenger, if you truly believe in Allah in the last day. So, my jama'ah, whatever my jama'ah is, whatever my madhab is, whatever the issue is in my madhab, I'm a brand spanking new Muslim. Unlike you guys, my mother and my father didn't give me Islam. I had to learn about Islam, and here I am. I'm a Muslim. All right? So now, as a Muslim, I want to practice Islam. So when I think the Adhan should be like this, or I should pray like that, or it should be 20 rakat, or whatever the issue is, what I have to do is, I have to refer that thing back to what did Allah say? What did His Messenger say? Not what did they say in Mirpur in the village back over there in Dadyao. That's what they said in Dadyao. Now, I, African American, I gotta follow that? Or do I have to follow what the Prophet brought, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? It's simple as that. But the way the Muslims are is, I don't like you because you're not for my jama'ah. You're not for my madhah. You're not for my masjid. We've abandoned the Quran. Allah mentions so many ayat. وَمَنْ لَمْ يَحْكُمْ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْكَافِرُونَ وَمَنْ لَمْ يَحْكُمْ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الظَّالِمُونَ وَمَنْ لَمْ يَحْكُمْ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْفَاسِقُونَ Three ayahs saying the same thing. Whoever doesn't judge by what Allah revealed, they are the kuffar, they are the fusa fasiqeen, they are the vanimun. So many ayahs, so many ayahs about this issue. 
وإذا قيل لهم تعالوا إلى ما أنزل الله وإلى الرسول رأيت المنافقين يصدون عند السدودة when they said to them come to what Allah revealed and come to the messenger you'll find them saying nah, 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 we're not doing that that's what Abu Lahab and Abu Jahl and the Munafiqeen, that's what they used to say so Allah revealed all of those ayat over and over and over and over making this point crystal clear in our religion crystal clear so we have these issues, listen to me because I'm not talking against your medhab or against your country or your people I'm just saying, this is how it goes here is my daughter. No, no, I don't want to use my daughter. A man's daughter gets divorced. So after the divorce, she wants to go to the local authorities and she wants to sue the man for half of his wealth. We say, hey, 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 sister, sister, sister. That's not what Allah revealed. Don't go to the non-Muslims and do that. What are you talking about? That's abandoning the Quran. The mother died, the father died, they left property behind, they left money behind. The eldest sister wants to take all of it. The eldest money wants to take, the eldest brother or sister wants to take all of the money. Because they, 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 they're the eldest or, or they did do a lot, but whatever, that's not their religion. You don't get all of it. You don't get all of it. What are you doing? So we have a lot of these types of issues in our culture. Where we'll put the culture before what Allah revealed and what the Prophet revealed, some Allah, what the Prophet brought, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. And there are many ayah, but I don't have enough time. But this point by itself should be the one that we should just keep mentioning it. And now we're dealing with these Muslims who are the experts who come on LBC. You know LBC, the radio program? LBC. People who are changing normative Islam, the experts, Muslims who are talking about Islam, they have a problem with hijab, the woman doesn't have to wear hijab, and they start coming up with all these crazy ideas. Crazy ideas. Where do you get that from? That's not in the Quran. The Quran is against what you're saying. That's abandoning the Quran. And some of that, it is in the realm of disbelief. Disbelief. So many ayat وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ اتَّبِعُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ قَالُوا بَلْ نَتَّبِعُوا مَا أَلْفَيْنَ عَلَيْهِ آبَاءَنَا أَوَلُوا كَانَ آبَاءُهُمْ لَا يَعْقِمُنَ الشَّيْءٍ وَلَا يَحْدِدُونَ When they said to them, follow what Allah revealed, they say, no, we're going to follow what we found our fathers doing. Allah said, even though their fathers didn't have any knowledge and they weren't guided aright. So when the prophets and the messengers, all of them, came to their people and gave them da'wah, all Prophet Muhammad said to the people of Hwani was, Say la ilaha illallah. They said, no, our fathers didn't say that. And I can give you some really crazy examples of people who do this. I'll give you one, right? In Africa, East Africa, Somalia, Eritrea, Ethiopia, some place in West Africa, and Gambia. They mutilate the little girl when she's small by giving her a khitan, circumcision. And they mutilate her. Mutilate her. What they do is haram. I mean, not only is it haram, it's crazy. It's like Quraysh. The man has a baby, his wife has a baby, it comes out a girl, and they took the girl and go and bury the girl in the dirt. And if you said to him, why did you do that to your daughter? She was so beautiful, nice eyes, nice hair. Why, why did you do that? He said, because this is what my fathers used to do. But man, that's your baby girl. What's wrong with you? Well, my fathers used to do that. Now, everybody could look at me and say, Quraysh were crazy when they did that. And those East Africans who take their daughters and do what they do today, 2018, non-Muslims, non-Muslims said, if you're from those countries and you travel, when you come back with your child, they'll stop you at the airport. And they'll take your daughter and check her. Now Muslims do that. Just like this forced marriage. They do that to other people. Now with the West East Africans who do that, you'll sit there and you say, that's crazy. But do we have the ability to say and to identify from our own culture things that we're doing that is all, they're all so insane and it's crazy? You can't force your daughter to marry someone she doesn't want. That marriage is for you, your wife, your brother, your, that's, that is for you. It's not for what your daughter wants. And again, I'm not against anybody, I'm not against, 
uh, that type of marriage if the girl is okay with it and the boy is okay with it. So, we don't judge by what a lot of people do. We got to move on. Another person who the Prophet would be an opponent to because he abandoned the Quran, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is the individual who doesn't read the Quran. He doesn't read it and he doesn't listen to it. The last time he picked up the Quran, the last time he picked it up, whether it's Ramadan or outside of Ramadan, he doesn't really know. He's been a Muslim for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, 60 years. Not once in his life has he gotten through the whole recitation of the Quran in the month of Ramadan. Not once. Not that it's wajib. I'm not saying it's wajib. And if you don't read all of the Quran in Ramadan, you're sinning. I'm not saying that. But we do claim we love the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We claim that. But our love is that cultural thing. It's that thing like, you know, just fasting, don't eat, don't drink, that's it. No, it's more than that. Loving him is practicing what he did, trying to practice it. And even when we make mistakes, we have to make toba. But we have to try. But instead, we want to take the shortcuts. Anyway, I told you that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam guys, our prophet, our Nabi, in the month of Ramadan, he used to read the Quran more. And he used to listen to the Qur'an more. So that's one of the benefits, of the many benefits of taraweeh. Don't let this taraweeh, shaitan, come and rip you off. Just rob you, rob you blind. Because you won't come to the masjid to pray taraweeh. You don't have to read a whole juice. You don't have to read a whole juice. But the hadith said, whoever stands in Ramadan with iman and expecting a reward, he'll be forgiven. Prophet Muhammad said, whenever a person is going to pray, his deeds, his mistakes, his sins are put on his shoulder and his head. Every time he make record and sajda, they fall off. Prophet Muhammad said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the salat is the best thing that you can do. So if you can make more, make more. That's taraweeh. Some of you have not been praying at some time in your life. There was a time you was praying. You weren't praying. You wasn't practicing. You wasn't praying at all. Rasulullah said, Yom Al-Qiyamah, the first thing Allah will look at are your salats. Allah will say to the malaik and he knows, look at the salat of my slave. If it is full, complete, write it down as complete. And if it is lacking, he missed some, he didn't have khushur in some, he didn't concentrate in some. If it's like that, then look at his tatawah, look at his sunnah prayers. And his sunnah prayers, make them, help them to complete the wajib ones. Now, our culture, our madhah, it tells us when you miss prayer. I remember when I became a Muslim, I was with a group of people. They were spinning me around. And then I realized, man, you guys are lost in the sauce. You don't have a clue. So I stepped away from them guys. They didn't know what in the world they were talking about. Then I went and I met some brothers, mashallah. They were from Pakistan. I said, okay, these guys, they're real Muslims. They also had their issues, man. And I remember they were telling me how I have to do the sunnah prayers, especially after Isha. I was like, what, man? This, I got to do all of that? I was a brand spanking Muslim. I became a Muslim in the month of Ramadan. And it was long hours. Like now, 1986. It was like 1890. I never fasted in my life. And I became a Muslim in Ramadan. These cats had me believe it. I have to fast from Fajr time, and we break our fast after Salat al-Isha. And I used to say to myself, man, this religion is hard, man. I'm getting ready to get out of this religion. Because they didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know what they were doing. They were making the religion hard on me. Hard. So my point, my point is, you miss prayers during your life. Somebody will tell you, you have to calculate these prayers. You can't make up a miss salah. There's no proof for that. You miss salah, you have to make toba. You made a major sin. You can't even calculate how many prayers you miss. There's no way of calculating because you don't know. In those years that you were not praying, you pray sometimes. You will never be able to get to the exact number. So how do you solve that problem? You make dua to Allah to forgive you and you don't return to it. And you make more nawafid. Tahir to masjid, salat to duha, two before dhuhr, four before dhuhr, two after, four after, two before asr, four before asr. You make as many of those as possible. Anytime you make wudu and taraweeh. You just keep doing it. Because if your wajib prayer is lacking, the sunnah prayers, all of them, will help them to go up. 
So who here is not in need of making that salah? And another thing, uh, I'm like you, we don't, we don't know Arabic, so I'm here, the ma'am is reading the Quran, I'm tired because I just ate, broke my fast for Maghrib, and the only time I, me, I don't know about you. As soon as I break my fast and I start eating, my legs start saying, you know, my house is really nice, it's so comfortable in here, it's Allah is Rahman and Rahim, <laughs> Allah is so generous, and, and I, I find every reason why, man, I ain't going to that mischief. And my conscience say, but you the imam. <laughs> so I don't know how it is for you guys. But you get the picture. Your motivation has to be jihad in the daytime, jihad in the nighttime. The jihad in the nighttime, get yourself to that masjid. And the motivation, I don't know what he's saying. Okay, but just know this. Every time you go into record, all of that stuff you did is falling off your shoulder. Every time you go into sajda, all that stuff you did is falling off your shoulder. That's the motivation. From the benefit of Salat al-Taraweeh is that the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Aqrab ma yakunu al-abd min rabbihi wa wa sajid fa akfir wa dua. The closest you are to your Lord is in sajda. So when you're in that sajda, make a lot of dua. Like what the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allahumma ya muqallim al-qulub, thabbit qalbi ala deenik. There are people leaving this religion today. Oh Allah, help my kids. Guide my kids. Make this lot between me and my wife. All, all these issues that we have. So from abandoning the, the Quran and Khwani is not reading it and not listening to it. Listen to this. It's important. Allah mentioned in the Quran, قَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَا تَسْمُوا لِهَادُ Quran. Allah told us about the Kufar Quraysh. Rasulullah would read the Quran in Mecca, giving da'wah. The Kufar would say, this ayah said, the disbeliever said, don't listen to this Quran and make noise when he reads it so that you can be the uppermost. So when the Prophet would read the Quran, there were some intelligent people who didn't listen to the he said, she said. They would listen to him. And then they would accept Islam and say, that book is from Allah. That book is from Allah. Somebody tell me, how did the Prophet know, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that Al-Iraq, Syria, uh, Afghanistan, um, Kashmir, Palestine, he said one of the signs of Yom al is there's going to be a lot of bloodshed in our ummah. And all of the nations will come together to get us. How did he know that? All of those things in the Quran, what he told us about. When the jinn heard the Quran in Surah Al-Ahqaf, in Surah Al-Jinn, Say to them, Muhammad, it has been revealed to me that a group of jinn, they were listening, and they said, we heard the Quran, it guides to the truth, and those jinn became Muslims. And he used to go out in the desert. After they became Muslims, they brought their people. He would go out to the desert, tell Abdullah ibn Mas'ul, sit right there and don't move. And he made a line, don't move. And he would go out. And then he would sit with the jinn. And the jinn would come to Abdullah ibn Mas'ul. And he was frightened, but he wouldn't move. Because the Prophet said, don't move. And then the Prophet would come and tell them, I was with the jinn. They accepted Islam. Bring them over there and they could see the fire and where they were sitting. Like if someone said to one of us, hey, I want you, I'm going to give you a thousand pounds. I just want you to stay in the grave during the night time. Just all night to sleep in the grave. We made a, we made a bed for you in the grave. You can just sleep down there in the, in the cover. Everybody got to say, man, you crazy. I ain't sleeping in no grave, man. I ain't sleeping in no grave. But that was the strength and the courage and the manliness that the Prophet had to go to those people, the creation of the jinn, and give them doubt. So many people would hear the Quran and it would affect them. Did you guys see that man? And that thing went viral. He was in the store and a nice recitation of the Quran was going on and he was listening to it. That now Muslim man, did you guys see that thing? And he was saying, oh, this is beautiful. This is a beautiful recitation. Did you guys see that? I know you guys don't. Watch and uh, have what's up up here. I know. But I saw it. I saw it. There are a number of them on the social media. Point is, 
He used to read the Quran and there's benefit in listening. His companion, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, was reading the Quran. Prophet Muhammad was walking by, he heard he stopped and he just listened to him. And he didn't know that he was listening to him. After that, he realized Prophet Muhammad was there. Prophet Muhammad sallam, said, your recitation of the Quran is beautiful. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari said, Ya Rasulullah, if I knew you were standing there, I would have made it even more beautiful. Showing, it's not showing off. It's not riya. If you want to do something to make people do good or benefit from the thing that you're doing. He said, I would have made it more beautiful. He was sitting with Abdullah bin Mas'ud. Again, he told him, Iqra, Ali al-Quran. Read to me the Quran. Abdullah bin Mas'ud said, Ya Rasulullah, I read it to you and then you was revealed. He said, Inni uhibun asma'u min ghayri. I love to hear it from other than me. When you're reading the Quran, you have to pay attention to, to tajweed. You have to make sure you're doing everything right. But when someone else is reading it, you can pay more attention to it. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, so I started reading Surah Al-Nisa from the beginning. And then I got to the ayah where Allah Ta'ala said, فَكَيْفَ إِذَا جِئْنَا مِنْ كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ بِشَهِيدًا وَجِئْنَا بِكَ عَلَىٰ هَأُولَاءِ شَهِيدًا How is it going to be Muhammad, Yawm Al-Qiyam, when we bring the Prophet with his respective community, his ummah, and we bring you as a witness over this community? He said to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, حَسْبُكَ If you want someone to stop reading the Quran, you say, حَسْبُكَ That's enough. That's how you, that's the sunnah. He's reading the Quran, Hasbuka. That's when he stopped. Ibn Mas'ud said, I stopped. I looked up. فَإِذَا عِنَّاهُ تَذْرِفَانِ His eyes were shedding tears. He used to love to hear the Quran from other than himself. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he was the expert. As for reading the Quran, oh boy. He said, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, الماهر بالقرآن مع سفرة الكرام البررة والذي يقرأه وهو يتتعت فيه وهو عليه شاد فلو أجران. Listen to this again. The person who reads the Quran and he is an expert. He knows what he's doing. He knows where to stop. He knows the elongation. He knows تجويد. He knows the قلقلة. He knows the قراءة. It's not all about the voice. It's knowing what you're doing. He's an expert. Yom al -Qiyam, his reward, he will be raised up with the manatik of Yom al And the one who reads the Quran and it's difficult for him, and he stutters, yet the ta'atahu, like us, we're not Arabs. So I'm going to read the Quran, and I'm going to read the Quran, and I'm going to say, uh, Alhamdulillah, Rabbullah, Alhamdulillah, Rabbillah, and me, Ar-Rahman. And then whoever reads it like that and it's difficult, he'll get a double reward. You and me will get a double reward. Why? Why? Because there's a principle that comes from the hadith. You will get rewarded, this hadith said, according to the difficulty that you go through. Remember this. You'll be rewarded according to the difficulty that you have to go through. Meaning, the one who lives right across the street and he crosses the street, comes into the mosque, he get a reward. But the one who lives 50 houses down will get more. And the one who lives six streets over will get more. People who are fasting in Mirpur, and it's real hot, they're going to get more reward than the people who are fasting when it's warm and cold. People who are fasting, like us, 18, 19 hours, you'll get a reward more than the one who's fasting 12, 13 hours, provided you don't make it difficult on yourself. Some people, they make it difficult on themselves, expecting more reward. No. No. People of this Boko Haram, a Shabab of Somalia, Daesh, ISIS, all of this stuff, Taliban, all of that stuff. You're making the religion difficult on yourself. That's not our religion, what you're doing. That's not our religion. You get punishment for what you're doing, making things unnecessarily difficult. Some of our elders, you shouldn't be fasting. He has diabetes. He has some sickness. He's taking medicine. You shouldn't be fasting. Fasting in your case is haram. You shouldn't even be fasting. But he can't see himself not fasting. He has to fast. Although he shouldn't be fasting. He says, no, I'm going to get rewarded because it's difficult. No, you made it difficult on yourselves. So when we look at these long hours, don't complain. Just say, okay. We have long hours and other people have shorter hours, but we get rewarded. 
So, as it relates to the Quran, if you find difficulty in reading the Quran, you get a double reward. What's our excuse, as the ayah said? Surah Al-Rahman. فَبِأَيِّ آلَاءِ رَبِّكُمَا تُكَذِّبَانِ Which are the favors which you can <coughs> It's an opportunity. Lastly, Akhwani, and there are many other things, but lastly, I want to mention this is, not memorizing the Quran is abandoning the Quran. Not reading the Quran with tajweed is abandoning the Quran. We are not Arabs. If there's an Arab person here who has a PhD in Arabic language, PhD in Arabic language, he's an adib. If you give him the Quran and you told him, and he wasn't taught how to read it, he will not read the Quran correctly. He'll read Arabic, but he won't read the Quran. Allah Ta'ala commanded us, tartila. Read the Quran with tartil, with tajweed. Read it correctly. So Prophet Muhammad was taught how to read the Quran. What to read and how to read. When Jibril came and said to him, Iqra. He said, well, what should I read? Iqra. What should I read? Iqra. What should I read? Then he told them what to read and how to read it. Iqra bismi rabbika ladhi khalaqa. خَلَقَ مِنْ سَانَ مِنْ عَلَقَ اِقْرَبْ وَرَبُّكَ الْأَكْرَ مَنْ لَذِي عَلَّمَ بِالْقَلَبِ عَلَّمَ الْإِنسَانَ مَا لَمْ يَعْلَمْ He told him what to read and how to read. عَلَّمُهُ شَدِيدُ الْقُوَى He was taught by one who was powerful and mighty. Jibreel used to come to him and teach him how to read. So you have to make it your business, not just to sing your son. We also have to do some touch read of the Quran. And there are some other issues at Hawaii, but we're going to stop here, inshallah, and we want to thank you, brothers, for giving us this opportunity to get the reward from Allah, inshallah, by coming to this community in Akrotin for the first time, inviting you guys to connect yourselves to the Book of Allah, Azrajah. The Prophet said about the Quran, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the Quran, Habrullah al-Mamdood min as samai il al-Ard. The Quran is the rope of Allah that is extended from the heavens because Allah is above the seven heavens in the way that befits His majesty. He says, so hold on to that rope of Allah. That ayah that he revealed in, in, in Surah Ali Imran. This ayah, he mentioned, you'll find that tafsir of that in that ayah. Hold on all together with the rope of Allah, this Ummah. What's the rope of Allah? It's the Quran. But those people, they have one interpretation of the rope of Allah. Those people over there, their interpretation is cursing Abu Bakr and Umar. Those people over there, their interpretation is being liberal. Those people, their interpretation is uh, um, you don't have to practice. And, then, and this is the problem that we're dealing with, the challenge that we're dealing with. But I'm saying. Shukran, Jazakumullah khairan, giving me this opportunity to come with this message. The Quran, the Quran. You guys, make that Quran mean something in this message and in your lives. And obviously, we're going to talk about the Quran. We have to talk about the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if we're going to talk about the Sunnah and the Quran, we're going to have to also talk about understanding that Quran and the Sunnah, the way those companions understood it. So if you guys have any questions for 10 minutes, inshallah, we'll deal with any of the questions that you may have, whether it's connected to the Dars or Quran questions, general questions, Ramadan, whatever. Sayfullah, you got a question, little man? No? What's your, what's your name? Dean. Dean? You did a good job, man. You did a good job. I'm proud of you. What's your name? Hasnin. Hasnin? Yeah. I was with your dad. He brought me in the car. You two brothers? No, the answer is yeah. We're brothers in the religion, man. But I know what you're talking about. You guys have any questions, Ikhwani? Okay, then. May Allah. Fadr, ya akhi. Fadr. Barakallahu. Wa fikum barakallahu. Akhi, you know when me and Puris come together and we don't open the windows, we, we, we take up all the air. You know, that's how we are, where we all come from. Open up these doors, man, and these windows. Let's get some air up in this joint. We don't have to fast from nice air, man. Cool air now. Food, drink, relationships, the air is okay. Doesn't break your fast, man. I will tell you, you okay, my man? Good to see you, man. I eat with Fadr Yahi. So, 
أحسن الله إليك أنت إمامهم أنت إمامهم المغربي كلموني عنك أحسن الله إليكم يا أحسن الله جزاك الله خير يا أخي تفضل يا أخي تفضل الخير واصل إن شاء الله سبحان الله أنا I agree with you. I feel sorry for the Muslims, for the reverts, especially in our community. Do you know why? From the two sides, from the people with good aqidah and from the people who corrupted with corrupted aqidah. My experience here, the people with bad aqidah, how you said, they will come to you, do this one, this one, this one, this one, sunnah, nafila. Let him pray for it first and after talk about sunnah and nafila. Teach him the basic things. Just Islam, like how you said, one brother become a Muslim, the first thing you have to do khitab, circumcise. Oh no, I can't. Oh, that is not good. Oh, if you left the Islam, we'll cut your head. Subhanallah. Come inside the Islam, you have to lose part of your body. Living the Islam, you have to lose part of your body. That's not Islam. Good aqidah. I found another problem with them. What? There is no relation with Quran at all. Because Quran, you have to copy Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on Sahaba in three things. The Aqeedah, Ibadah and Mu'amala. Aqeedah, belief, Ibadah, worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Mu'amala, how you act, your manners. There is no manners, subhanallah. Until my experience with them. That's why, alhamdulillah, in this masjid, I lift all the people I used to know. In this masjid, we build in one thing. We move the ulama if they follow Quran and Sunnah. If you don't follow Quran and Sunnah, we don't care who is he. We're not going to listen to what he said. We need to go back to solve all the problems between us. We need to go back direct to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Sahaba alayhi wa sallam. Easy and basic. So don't tell me your shaykh, my shaykh, his shaykh, my peer, or I don't know what. Don't believe these things. Our shaykh Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alayhi wa sallam. So this is one. Two, about the guidance. Quran is the book of the guidance. Just subhanallah, we did talk. Um, Last, uh, and we prove from the Quran the golden ratio from the Quran. We prove from the Quran, we show them from the Quran. They are in the, on the board. What? The speed of light from the Quran. Mm -hmm. We prove from the Quran a lot of things which Quran guides us in all the, 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 in every single thing in your life. It's a guidance. Guidance, how we said in quality. In the economy, in uh, uh, sociology, how we, to live with each other, how to respect each other, guiding the health, how to be a healthy person, strong person. SubhanAllah. But was as a Muslims, until that's why I told you, SubhanAllah. Here we find a lot of problems. Be honest in this masjid. <laughs> SubhanAllah. Do you know why? Until the people they come to fight, they say, we don't want you to tell our kids to pray or fast. This is way of the hadith you mentioned. Uh, uh, the, the worst one from the, the, the people, the one who قاتل a Muslim and the one who fights a Muslim, قاتل نبي قاتل he fight a Nabi or قاتله Nabi. So قاتل with Alif means you can fight. I'm not going to listen to the Hadith until Jazakallah khair what you said. Sallallahu alaihi That they were dancing to Kufar to Quraysh. One who feed they were dancing. لا إله إلا الله. والله this is what we start facing here. I make dua for you guys as well that Allah will just help you. Gotta take it easy with one another and just remember that the companions are the blueprint for success. They were people similar to us. I wouldn't say just like us, just like we don't say Prophet Muhammad was just a man. We tell people don't go overboard and have a hulu because he's a man. We won't say he's just a man because he was more than just a man. But nonetheless, he's a best. And I'm not going to say the companions were just like us. No, because just as Allah chose him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah chose those companions. My point is, they had the blueprint. And from them, they had some problems with themselves. From them, they made sins and this and that. But they showed us how to take the community forward. And it can be done. It can be done. But it requires us doing what? Like the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I left you people two things, you'll never go astray if you hold on to them, the Book of Allah and my Sunnah. So, 
That's my advice to you. Take it easy with each other. Relax. Stay in the middle. Don't be of the people of Hulu. Don't be too rough and tough. And don't be apologetic and scared and afraid. Both of them are problematic. The one who on the Sunnah, everybody's an innovative, innovative except me. That's a problem. Everybody is no good. We see people come to the masjid in Ramadan who normally don't come. They're like, you're Ramadan Muslims. Hey, what are you talking about? Who are you? Alhamdulillah, they're in the masjid. How many people made Toba in the month of Ramadan from the Salaf of this Ummah? The man, his name was Malik ibn Dinar. He used to drink Khamr and he was a highway robber. He was robbing people. Sticking them up and robbing them for their stuff. And he heard the man reading the Quran and he read the ayah. He read that, he heard that ayah, heard the Quran. And he said, now the time has come for me to make Tawbah. So now this person, perhaps perchance is in the mischief. Don't be rough and tough. And don't be mutasahilun. Everything is okay. You don't have to wear hijab. You don't, you don't have to pray. To, no. Over here, you want to kill everybody. Jihad, jihad. Nope, 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 nope. You're making things rough and tough. And over here, you want to say there's no jihad. No, there's jihad. It's place, it's time, it's people, it's ahkam, it's adab. That's our religion. We don't want those leaders who apologize about things we don't have to apologize about. Just you guys, be in the middle. Be in the middle. Elders, work with the youngsters. Youngsters, work with the elders. You know, it's like a race. I always give that example. A um, relay race where you run around the track. So four people, they're running. I have the theme. And I'm going to run, and I'm going to hand it off to him. And then he's going to get it. We have to have a smooth transition. And then he runs, he gives it to the third one. He runs, he, that's how we are, the elders and the youngsters. The elders have the upper hand. That's the deen. Blessings are with the oldest. That's how it is. But the elders have to recognize, like I mentioned, Abdullah ibn Abdullah Abbas, uh, Abu Sa'id al Khudri. Those young, they have a position. And this is what we find in our community. We're running the race, we're running the race, and, 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 and the guy is running, he want, to get, he want to get the baton from the elder, and the elder just keep running by him. He don't give it to him. He doesn't give it. He just keep running and he's going to conk out. He's going to run out of speed. Then the other people are going to pass him in the race. And then we're going to be stuck like Chuck. We're going to be stuck like Chuck. We got to be in it to win it. And that comes with all of this information that we have. Okay, Ikhwani. I'm going to bounce right now. Shukran, Sheikh, Dada'ali, Lala, Saab. And the rest of you people for having me here. May Allah bless you guys. All right? Assalamu alaikum. Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdika. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfirullah wa tuhu ilaik. Assalamu alaikum.